Hello everyone and welcome to Deeply Rooted. I'm your host, Robin Norgren, in the final days of 2021. So there's a lot of things going on over here that I'm excited to tell you about. One of them has to do with um, a project I've been thinking about for quite a few years now, um, having to do with art journaling. And I will roll that out for you um, very soon. But I just want to say thank you for joining me as we have conversations and um, just times to sit and think and really um, embody um, the reality that we are spiritual beings having human experiences and desiring to live those human experiences more fully. I'm so glad you dropped by. Did you know that you have the heart of a dancer and the mind of a warrior? Linda Sescoscio says, when we are enthusiastic, when we are enthusiastic, we are intoxicated with passion, rooted in our true selves, and it flows into all we do. Flow. Where do you find it in your life? What amount of time do you spend thinking about the area where you see the most flow? What intoxicates you with passion? Is it the same place that you feel your flow? And how can you bring more, more, more of this into your life? Today's suggestion from the book titled The Art of Noticing by Rob Walker, 131 Ways to Spark Creativity, Find Inspiration, and Discover Joy in the Everyday. Discover the big within the small. Alex Coleman is the curator of an unusual museum called Museum with two M's in the front of the word and two M's in the back of the word. And this museum is on the little trafficked one block Cortland Alley in Lower Manhattan. The exhibition space is six feet by six feet and used to be a part of a freight elevator shaft. The objects on view are just as distinct as the room they occupy. Coleman calls them examples of the vernacular, but they might look to some like random doodads. In fact, they reflect a remarkable eye for the deeper meaning that can lurk in the overlooked. These objects weren't created to be appreciated as pieces of art, Kalman said on one of my visits, and yet they reveal our psychology, our needs, and our desires, he insisted some element of who we are. Kalman fits a remarkable and rotating variety of items on the slender shelves that line museum's tight walls. He pointed out a small sign, maybe two inches square, evidently from a, muse- of a, from a motel. Dear guest, it read. Because of the popularity of our guest room amenities, various items in the room are for sale. $25 for the clock, $15 for a hand tile, and so on. Should you decide to take these items from your room instead of obtaining them from the executive housekeeper, we will assume you approve a corresponding charge to your account. Translated, steal what you want and we will bill you for it. This object explains the catalog is the result of a capitalist handling of crime. This sweeping sentiment can be pinned on an insignificant item because of Kalman's remarkable ability to look and see. He openly acknowledges the influence here of his parents, designer Tybor Kalman and artist Mara Kalman, 
Every household has a first language, a kind of language of the home, he says. And luckily for me, the language of my home was looking. I was just kind of raised to look around. This means Kalman was also raised to discover the surprises within the everyday work day. By, by way of seeing deeply. He remembers, for instance, coming home from school one day to find someone installing a collection of onion rings, the kind you'd get from a greasy spoon, with unbelievable precision, precision in the living room. His parents evidently had decided these objects were worth serious consideration. In short, Cowman has spent a lifetime of looking carefully, he said, and seeking out the humanity and the humor and the absurdity in things. All of which inform Kalman's deconstruction of the motel sign, a minor incidental object that reveals a sophisticated set of thoughts about security and the profit motive. A ter- deterrent filtered through the language of hospitality. Kalman hopes to remind us that we should be very curious and look around and not take things for granted. Find the joy in wondering about that toilet paper roll or that coffee cup lid or that onion ring, he said, and think, perhaps this is just as strong a definition of who we are as anything some social political journal might stamp on us. It's looking at the big through the small. Well, that sounds like a fantastic exercise, doesn't it? To look at the big through the small. Now, many of my friends who listen to the podcast are teachers and, and parents. And so that is something that we are invited to do on a pretty regular basis. But I really think it can translate into anything um, that we ordinarily um, just view as uh, a means to an end, like a spoon or a toothpick or whatever comes to mind when I say look at the small, at the big through the small. So I would invite you to do that today. So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I would like to offer you a couple more suggestions for my artists out there who need permission to unfold. And this is from a book titled Mona Brooks, oh, sorry, the author is Mona Brooks and her book is called Drawing with Children. And we've been talking about this over the last few months that this is also a great primer for adult beginners as well. And beginner in the sense as um, trying again to perceive what artist really means outside of all the uh, labels and preconceived notions that you may have been um, introduced to when you were a child. But here's two other permissions to give yourself. Don't prevent yourself from copying or getting ideas from things you see. Let me say that again. Don't prevent yourself from copying or getting ideas from things you see. You'll interpret them differently. And it's just, it's just the nature of it. It's coming from your hand. Therefore, it will carry your personality. There will be subtleties and differences. And I bet that it just might sneak up on you and surprise you about how you will then be inspired to take something you begin copying and put your own twist on it. And also, be patient with yourself and have fun. 
remember that all artists, and I mean all of them, experience a certain dissatisfaction with much that they produce. So don't throw it away. A drawing you think that isn't perfect, you're going to learn from it. And if you actually do continue to practice, even a month from now, you will look back at it and you will be able to see how far you've come just from putting a little effort into it every day. This is our final segment on our series, What is Prayer? from a book on spiritual direction from Henry Nouwen. And the last component of prayer I'd like to talk about is prayer as contemplation. Here's a segment from his essay on this matter. Prayer is an attitude of an open heart, silently in tune with the Spirit of God, revealing itself in gratitude and contemplation. Prayer is not just crying out to God for help, although it certainly can start there, or talking with God about our thoughts. Prayer is a silent listening that leads to contemplation in the presence of God. Particular prayers can become prayerfulness of the heart through cultivating an attitude of gratitude and a spirit of contemplation. As we learn how to pray, Somewhere along the way, we experience the crying out to God about our needs as a monologue, a one-sided affair. And even when prayer becomes dialogue with God speaking and answering our prayers, we long for more of God's presence. The truth is that prayer is more than feeling, speaking, thinking, and conversing with God. To pray also means to be quiet and listen whether or not we feel God is speaking to us. More than anything, prayer is primarily listening and waiting. We listen for God in an attitude of openness of heart, humility of spirit, and quietness of soul. We let our mind transcend into our heart and there stand in the presence of God. Over time, our particular prayers can become prayerfulness, and the quality of prayerfulness makes us more aware of the divine presence. Gradually, we learn that God is not a silent God who does not want to be heard or experienced. God is not a resistant God who has to be manipulated into paying attention to us. God is not a reluctant God who has to be convinced to do something good for us. No, we come to realize that God is a God of compassion, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, who came to dwell in our midst and who longs to be listened to so that healing can come. To summarize, prayer is a crying out to God, a simple conversation and a contemplated listening in the presence of God who loves us. And once we learn these aspects, we can make prayerfulness a daily practice. And thus, as Apostle Paul says, pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17